Welcome to a special edition of the Tower House M podcast. Uh, it's not part of our normal uh, routine, if you like, but you know, these last few weeks of anything but uh, being routine uh, at Reading Football Club. Um, joined as always by Mr. Ross Weber from overseas, but more importantly, uh, our special guest today, Abby, who, uh, as you know, we had on start of last season. I think Abby was the last time we had you on, and it was it was slightly better times then. Um, but we're you know we're here really today to to talk about uh, the decline in the women's team and and decline in in the focus on them and and the way that they are handled within our club. Really, um, we'll we'll go to you first, Abby. Just kind of introductions. I would ask how you are, but I think I I kind of know the answer. <laughs> Um, I think it's helped helped me that you've both delayed this twice. <laughs> so I've had just about enough time to sort of try and collect my thoughts on the whole thing, really. Um, and I think the, the word decline is probably not enough. I think decimation is probably <laughs> a better mm. choice of words, really. Um, I don't know. I think I've run out of emotions to feel at this point. I've cried many times this week. Um and felt quite pretty angry a lot of times as well. Um, I'm trying to find some positives in this as well. So yeah, just a real mix of emotions, definitely. Well, we're gonna we're gonna deal in the facts first of all to to start with, and then sort of talk a, a little bit about those feelings because it's um yeah it's an important part of, of where we're at as a football club, really as a as a collective football club. So um, we're gonna we're gonna say thanks first of all to our sponsors, ZC Said Films, who uh, recently just this week have, have signed on for another season of that uh, glorious banter at the podcast. So thank you very much for that, guys. Um, we are we're gonna get straight into the statement that was released by the club <clears throat> on Tuesday of this week. So we're gonna take a short break and then we'll be back with that. Keep up to date with all things Reading FC. Follow the Tilehurst End on Facebook and Twitter. This podcast is proudly sponsored by ZCZ Films. Remember, if you want to get involved in sponsoring the show, drop us an email to the at gmail.com. Right. Um, so we had rumblings of this, uh, you know, in terms of it, it being a confirmed decision um, the Friday previous, where a lot of stuff had come out through media outlets and a lot of uh, comments were made online but nothing official from the club we then had uh, an, a, you know what we class as an official statement that was put out through the uh, reading women's channel and that was on tuesday of, of this week just gone um just to recap for anyone who has been living under a rock and, and hasn't had the specifics really Effectively, and I'll read the top part of this. Red and Football Club can today can or can today confirm it has reluctantly withdrawn from the Barclays Women's Championship for the 24-25 season, with the women's first team now moving to tier five of the women's football pyramid. Um, I, I won't read all of it because it's there online, but it goes on to talk about funding and revenue and kind of operational strategies that they want to employ. But effectively, the the, the facts are, Abby, that a club that was, you know, very recently in the top end of the women's football division and, you know, holding their own until recently is now being demoted to tier five through no fault of their own um, and through no fault of the uh, playing qualities and attributes of, of those players. Before we kind of get into, you know, how you're feeling and, and where this leaves us as a, as a club, can you just fill people in on what tier five of the women's football pyramid actually looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for context, there are seven tiers in the women's football pyramid. <clears throat> so WSL at the top, which is obviously where we're most familiar with at this point in Reading's career, um, all the way down to tier seven, which is your, your proper grassroots kind of level of football, which is where I often play. Um, um, yeah, so <clears throat> they'll be facing teams... Uh, so I think there's 12 teams this year, um, if you now include Reading, but um, for some kind of Berkshire context, the, the likes of Ascot United and uh, Woodley United are in there, um, but also um, <clears throat> Oxford City are in there, so that's not that far away. Um, teams like uh, Wickham Wanderers, their first team are also in there as well. Um, but yeah, essentially, that they are grassroots levels of football so some of those clubs have some some nicer grounds themselves so for example Ascot they have their own ground but many of them do share 
share playing pitches and stuff like that. So <clears throat> Wickham, they play at Burnham's Ground, for example. Um, Woodley, they, they play at Bournemouth Pavilion. So obviously that's just up the road from goals in Reading, if uh, anybody needs some context there. So yeah, um, they are essentially now dropping down from from being a, having been a full-time outfit in the WSL to, to now being in and amongst the grassroots levels. Um, and like I said, I mean, I, I often play in tier seven, but actually if I if I really tried and really applied myself, I could probably get into those bottom half tier five teams. The fact that I could potentially play against the team that I support after having seen them so successfully in the in the WSL for so many years is kind of pr- pretty mental to really think about it. Um, not to discredit, obviously, the teams that play in those that, that tier and around that level, because actually... Kind of across the country, tier five is incredibly competitive, and there's more and more teams. Tier three, I suppose, is where it's starting to go, and then dropping down to tier four as well. But eventually, I think there's no reason why we won't start to see full time teams at tier five in the near future. Um, so, <clears throat> but yeah, for now, they're they're grassroots teams. Um, so yeah, that's that's where we're at really in terms of the pyramid. I mean, Ross, Abby's, you know, reference WSL there and grassroots in, in pretty much the same sentence to describe the current state of, of Reading FC women. Um, that's frightening, isn't it? Going from a full-time, what I'd class as a, a fully stocked team with internationals, highly acclaimed manager, uh, playing regularly at, at what you'd, you'd class as a, as a good ground you know, professional ground in, in the Select Car Leasing Stadium, the, the Medeski before that, to now be in a situation, as as Abby said, with, with due respect to these clubs, playing at a part-time, you know, volunteer level where most of those clubs are, are ground sharing. I mean, that's that just beggars belief, doesn't it? Yeah, um, it is really, really disappointing for sure. Um, and obviously, it's uh, it's it's no disrespect to um, the players playing in those leagues. You know, like like Abby, like we've just uh, talked about. But it is frustrating, um, given how recently it was that, that we were playing at you know big grounds and um, really hopefully you know inspiring um, every you know people and other you know women and, and girls and stuff around the area in Berkshire. It's frustrating. This line in the uh, statement about Reading has been amongst the elite of the women's game for many years, uh, you know, and competing against Chelsea, Arsenal, Man City, Man U, um, despite being one of the only clubs outside of the Premier League, which, you know, like makes me think, why was it there more uh, hesitation to do this then? I mean, we just uh, just sold uh, Michael Elise. Like there's a bit of money hanging around there. Like, couldn't we have invested that? uh here um so you know there's yes they you know you can say whatever you want about um financial stuff but uh there are decisions made here i you know you would have to think that have have led to this it also feels like a real consequence of the slow sale process at the moment you know we've had an exclusivity period it's lapsed and now i don't think we really particularly know where we are um so it's it's just a uh, this is probably the worst uh, aspect yet, I would say, of the, um, like I said, the, the slow sales process. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we've we've talked all season about the ownership issue for for the club in general, not just for the for the men's first team, as we know, have been hugely affected by this ongoing um, uh, sales process, if you like. But the reality is that we are still able to complete in the or compete in the in the league that we left with last season you know and, right. and going back to the women abby you know we we know that performances on the pitch weren't great last season we know that it probably wasn't what everyone connected with the club wanted to be in terms of league positions but you know in terms of the wholesale changes that were made in the summer as a result of going part time which you know was was only a year ago that this happened. You know the the first kind of um, a, you know bite, if you like, of, of this particular situation for the women's team. They were able to to stay up against all the odds, really, in terms of the teams that they were competing against in the championship. And now that's that's been taken away from them. I mean, you know, Ross Ross touched upon the, the money there, Abby. Do you do you think the money could have been found from somewhere if there was a real desire to keep the women's team structure as it was last season. Yeah, 
Without a doubt. I think, <clears throat> I mean, we've mentioned the the big dogs there of Chelsea and Arsenal and sort of things like that. Like, I don't think you can really have a conversation about clubs like Reading and anyone in the bottom half of the WSL and pretty much all the championship teams where, where you include them, really. They're, they're a different kettle of fish in that sense. So I actually I don't really think that <clears throat> you have to be ploughing millions of pounds into women's teams in clubs to actually be operating successfully. Um, trying to actually find any real information on what a tier two license involves is it's, it's hard work. I've looked many times and there is obviously stuff around finances and um, the kind of governments and things like that. And, but I don't, it's not, it's not an obscene amount of money that I don't, yeah, I just don't feel like there was enough done to really really consider that our our women's team should be staying in the championship because I think as well in the statement it said uh, something around five years essentially that they don't think that kind of based on um, like investment opportunities and the kind of external funding or anything like that like the they don't think that the direct financial return I think it said on investment is expected for at least five years I think that was like it seemed kind of vague as well, really. Like, what, what does that really mean? Um, but yeah, I, to go back to your point. Yeah, I, I don't think enough was done to really try and find the very limited amount of money it really needs right now. At the, the level that Reading are at to actually keep keep the team going, essentially in the, in the championship. Well, this is the thing: is that you know, being in the in the WSO is 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 a very different ball game. Quite literally, you know, you're full time, you've got larger wages. You know, you think about as you said those those larger clubs that have those huge international players and are able to, you know, to add to their squad over the season or, or over the season, but during the during the transfer windows and and, and getting the the real top players in in the women's game and and be able to get them to compete in in our league, if you like, but. You know, surely going to a part-time model this time last year would have saved some money. Um, and the model, or the, the kind of the figure that we were going off in the last pod, was around a million pounds a season. Now, whether or not that's inflated, whether or not that's doing justice to what needs to be done, I don't know. I'm not sure. But that that was the kind of figure that we were we were given <clears throat> and we were touted. So that's the kind of figure that we went off. Now, obviously, Ross has, has mentioned the Elise uh, fee, which we believe to be in a, in a region of about four and a half million pounds for us. Um, to, to put that into context, you know, Max Kilman has just left um, Wolves and, and gone to West Ham for 40 million, which means Maidenhead United, which are just down the road from us, are going to pocket around four million as well. So, you know, there, there are levels to this game, but actually 4.5 million for us as a club overall is massive and what we've got now is almost that money being ring fenced for the first team and there will be you know detractors about that there will be people that say I should be the case you know uh, a club living lives and dies on the um on the on the performance of the first team and where they're at but actually I've always been very open and and you know Ross said it last week about this being a community club and and this nonsense about you know, our, our football club being a community asset. Now, it, it isn't really. How, however well the community trust do, however well the academy does, if you are, you know, deliberately choosing to not invest and support a certain demographic that gives opportunities to people within the community, then you're not a community asset. Simple as that. Um, and that, that for me, was, was the biggest thing because, you know, I've seen it firsthand with with the young people that I work with when we had when when England won the Euros, there was a real big surge in in kind of uh, the girls that we've got asked are really interested in football and we work very very closely with the community trust in terms of harnessing that you know red and uh, women to their credit were very very good with tickets and giveaways and you know supporting us with getting not just the kids but the families into the games and, and watching it. You know, they were watching Liverpool, they were watching Man City, like all these clubs of players that they'd seen on the TV the previous summer. So regardless of whether they're walking around with red and shirts, the point is they were getting invested into the sport itself and actually, you know, really wanting to see women's football in, in the local area, which is what every child should should really be able to do. Um, you know, you, you, you touched upon the statement there a little bit and I, I want to focus back on that because... It was quite a long read. Um, 
it, it had to be really for the nature of what was being said. Ross, what what did you make of it overall? What was the kind of tone? You know, Abby's Abby's kind of shared her opinion that she doesn't think enough was done by the club. Do you do you support that based on what was written in this statement, or do you think actually, do you know what that they, they, they kind of gave it a good go, but it didn't work out? Yeah, I do think. Um... Like uh, Abby mentioned there that it's tough. It's been tough to actually get information. And I still think that like this is a little uh, vague in a lot of ways. Obviously, they're not going to give us the full rundown of the the financial situation. You know, sit there. You know, it's not going to be uh, Mark Bohm with a calculator going through why they why they've chosen to do this. But um yeah i mean it doesn't i mean is is it possible to square that circle where you can write a statement about something that's just so dreadful um without it coming across as a little crass um it, it's tough really like i i guess i sympathize a little bit with the person who had to write the statement but it still again is not providing enough information um and where i feel sorry for people there is um with the rumors maybe actual um, I'm not sure if this has actually happened yet, so I, I'll wait for that to be confirmed. But I believe that means that the Women's Academy is not running anymore or or what's really going on with that. So again, it's it's really frustrating with the communication. I hope that there's some way in which the Academy could still continue if they are going to, you know, Tier 5. Um, perhaps that's a, you know, a platform that um, some players coming through could use as a way to get experience against, you know, adult players, which is important for young players as they're coming through. Um, so, you know, if we're going to go to this level, why no Academy, I would say. And, and so more communication about that for me would be important too, because I think that when you consider that um i mean you know to quote one of my favorite bands of all time this this statement was good news for people who love bad news you know it was written exactly in that tone um because it it, it just <clears throat> for me personally as a statement there's a lot of waffle in there there's a lot of oh yeah but 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 actually i'm reading that and i'm thinking and we'll talk about the list of players or, or some of those players that have been released or the end of their contracts as a result of this situation and we'll, we'll do that later on in the pod but I'm thinking about some of the staff I know connected to the women's team that are going to find it very, very difficult, not because they're very good at their jobs, but because the market now is so congested with those jobs and the competition is so fierce that they have been left very little time to be able to um, access a new job in time for the new season. You know, if uh, I'm not saying it's good news at all, but if, if this information was shared at the very end of the women's season – that gives an extra, what, month and a half, two months for the staff in particular to be able to put a contingency plan in place. So it, it's, it's very, very difficult to read that and know that there are going to be a lot of staff connected with this football club that are going to suffer as a result of that and are going to find it very difficult time-wise to get a job for, for the new season starting. So that, that f- from my point of view, in terms of the timing, was, was you know, incredibly disappointing. Um I mean, Abby. You know, we we brought you on because you are, you're a fan. You know, you you know a lot about women's football, but you're a fan of of Red and Football Club, and you've always been very vocal around that. You know, obviously, you've you've done a lot of work and are working and are part of the the fabulous institution that is football in Berkshire, where you know you you recently gave out um, supporter of the year to Amy Louise Madison, who is a supporter of Reading FC Women. Um, just just kind of talk to us a little bit how the last week or so has been for you as a fan. Yeah, that that whole giving Amy the support thing just it's real real bittersweet because I know Amy like I'm friends with Amy and she's I, just, the dedication is absolutely insane. Like in the last two seasons, let alone the ten plus years that she's supported the club. I think she's driven something like 6,000 miles up and down the country. So she, wow. she's from South Shields and so she lives up there. That's, That's where incredible. she is, but she's she's a Reading fan and she's she's been to every single home and away game. I think bar one and that's because she had an operation. So and she was desperate to try and get to the game anyway, but doctor's orders yeah. meant that she didn't didn't go. So yeah, just my my heart absolutely breaks f- for for people like Amy and yeah, just the <clears throat> The, the the fan base it, small but mighty I think is how I'm going to describe them um, because 
there's it's it's not the hugest of fan bases and I think many people know that anyway but they're incredibly dedicated and it's it's tricky because of the way women's football is going that kind of contact that you you get in women's football is likely to become less and less um I think mm. you kind of are starting to see that with some of the bigger clubs especially as they start to to play in their their club stadiums um but even now having been as well that's the other thing as well is that Reading were the first first club in the WSL and first women's team to to put their women in in the club stadium full time um so that just is another sucker punch but yeah just the the the, the contact that a lot of fans have been able to have with the the players and stuff like, and the time that the players are willing to give over at the end of end of a game it's yeah that's I mean I, I suppose maybe it's from that set point of view it's potentially going to be even easier for them to still chat to them but actually none of them are there the players that they've been watching and supporting are, are all gone um so yeah it's yeah. I, I think the heartbreaking is the only only way I can really really describe how it's felt um and as I said earlier like just got, gone through all of the emotion from just a lot of mm. a lot of the time feeling pretty angry actually and I was sort of in disbelief when I first read the statement and I think I might have read it six or seven times now just to try and get my head around it and still not really understanding it and they kind of alluded to the fact that they looked at various avenues of of how they could support the women's team financially and just yeah doesn't seem to have really kind of gone through that enough I don't think um and actually we can see with clubs like Lewis for example as well who are a fellow championship side and being funded independently in Durham as well and they've been kind of up up and around the the top ta- top of the table in the championship for god knows how long and they're an independently run club so it feels strange that they seem to be doing as as well as they are and yet yeah, we're we're a club I'm obviously in league 1 at this point but previously very well supported and stuff like that and now suddenly we're in tier five um so yeah I can't really put put into words one particular emotion it's just been a little bit of everything I suppose there is a little slight level of relief that they haven't just got rid of them and mm. they're gone completely but actually as you've mentioned the, the list of departures I just think but do we even have a team to play next season so yeah yeah it's just a, it's a real kind of state of limbo right now and also like you say it would have helped to have maybe had this at the beginning of the season. I don't know if maybe it's because they were trying to find all the avenues and just explore all the options to actually keep them keep them there but actually yeah with <clears throat> with sort of I don't know seven weeks to go I suppose until the season starts yeah this is a real short amount of time for for everybody involved. Yeah, I mean, and just to touch on Ben, just real quick on how many you know players are are no longer there, and um, you know, like uh, what Abby said about how you know the players that the the fan base has been getting to know over the past few years. Um, with, with the the statement that came a few days later about the uh, players that were leaving the club, um, obviously there'll be. Um, some players that will have played for, I imagine lots of players who played for Reading last season who will want to play at a higher level than, than Tier 5. Um, I added it all up. There's more than 400 appearances uh, jettisoned, uh, you know, or 400 appearances worth of players jettisoned uh, by the club, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's awful. It's a, it's a lot of experience that the club is just getting rid of. Um, hmm. The Wikipedia page right now with the women's squad on is quite quite sad looking. Well, I mean, you know, on that note, with with the, you know, the statement and the, I was going to sort of call it a, re- a release and retain list, but it's not. <laughs> there's no re- retention on there. It's all released. Um, you know, Deanna Cooper, Tia Prima, Madison Perry, Brooke Hendricks, uh, Charlie Escort, uh, Esther Mayer Kith is on there. Lauren Wade, Charlie Wellings. I mean, we're talking about internationals here as well, right? Yeah. Like absolutely. these, these are players that you're not just gonna you know, turn up and, and, and go to a grassroots and go, yeah, they're good. We'll put them in as a, as a replacement. It's not, it's not going to work. And, you know, when you're looking at, at players like Tia Primer and, and Madison Perry in particular, who have come through the academy, you know, as Ross mentioned earlier about keeping the academy, it, 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 it defies belief that all of these pathways potentially are going to be closed 
and we will effectively be a closed shop in terms of bringing internal players through at this current stage and having to go to other places and, and bring players in. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but for a club, you know, as we referenced the Elise thing earlier, for a club that is famed in inverted commas for its academy and bringing players through, both on the men's and women's side, you know, let's, let's be real here. This is This is a massive, massive problem in terms of actually being able to bring players in. Um, and I, I don't know if this is accurate and, and Ross was talking about the Wikipedia page because he loves Wikipedia, but I, I worked out there was only two contracted players left at the club. Is that, is that right, Abby? Is that, is there more than two players or have we actually just got two players at the moment? Uh, that's what my understanding is. Yeah. And I'll be very surprised if they even stay anyway, um, to be honest. And just, just to yeah. touch on the, the academy as well. So <clears throat> For the under 21s or the professional game academy to operate, you need a tier two license. So you have to be in the in the in the championship to operate that because there's <clears throat> stuff around how you have to be delivering a certain number of age groups. Um and there has to be a certain number of development hours per week. I think it's between, I want to say, 12 and 16. And then there also has to be okay. a certain amount of like contact time with staff off the pitch as well in terms of um learning technicalities and stuff like that so that mm-hmm. is almost definitely gone um now that they've dropped down to tier five so yeah that wikipedia list as well i, I don't think that's accurate to be honest um so i yeah i don't think there's any anybody from the first team or the under 21s left and they've all, all gone all we're all moving on to past you i mean again you know i'm looking at tier prima and i'm thinking you know, she's come through the account. I don't know others others have, but I want to focus on her really because I say she's the most famous at the moment. That's not that's not true, but very recognisable, you know, very, very good on the pitch in terms of the way she plays. But she's a local girl, right? Yeah. And so the idea that you've come through, you know, you lived the dream of every football fan in terms of of going into the academy of your local club or getting picked up from grassroots or school level or whatever joining the academy, making her way through, making a first team, making what she what she done, 30, 40 appearances, something along those lines maybe. Um I and, think and you know that. and then fifty five, fifty six, something like that. There you go then. There you go. And then and then being told you've got to leave uh, is just well, I, I don't even know what that feels I I couldn't even comprehend what that feels like, you know. And I'm guessing that a lot of these players, you know, looking down the list that I've got here, would would have been interested and would have been up for staying and trying to kick on with the the management team that's in place from from last season and trying to get us back in the Premier League. You know, they 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 look like towards the end of the season there was a bit more of a stable base there, but now through no fault of their own, they're they're being asked to move and being asked to to move on because they can't can't you know can't be kept due to financial reasons and and the way the club is going. Um, and I think Ross, you know, this is the point that people make. You can be you know, pro women's football, you can be against women's football, you can be indifferent to women's football. But actually, as a football fan, if you wake up one day and you're told that your club is going to be unrecognisable from what it was before you went to bed the night before, that's, you know, that that's going to take a toll, right? You know, I'm thinking of in the men's game, you know, clubs like Berry, for example, I'm thinking of our own first team in terms of the the points deductions on a very smaller scale that we've had. It, it hits you mentally, yeah? You know, that there has to oh, be yeah. an impact from that. Yeah, definitely. And I'll go further and say I don't think you can not like women's football personally. If you like football, then you like men's football, you like women's football. It's just, you know, another variety of the the game um, as, a, as a viewing experience. And it provides the pathway for, um, you know, a, a 50% of the world's population. So for me, you know, like I'm very, um, you know, I play co-ed football over here in the, in the United States and just love it and... Um, you know, uh, as guys, but when we go back into men's league, you know, we take things that we've learned from playing with the ladies and, and vice versa. So, yeah, it'll it'll definitely hit mentally to to lose this team because there's just, I, I don't know, I did, there's no difference for me. It's football. It's all football. And the mm-hmm. job of the of Reading Football Club is to support football in the Reading community, which this is it. Like, that, that is what it is. So, for me, it really is... Um, quite a, a failure in that regard not protecting or not doing more to protect the the women's team yeah i mean we've we said time and again and 
you know, I've said that for me, Reading Football Club is the umbrella, right? So you want you want the right, men's first yeah. team to win. You want the women's to win. You want you know the girls under 18s to win. You want the, you know the boys under 15s. Whatever it is, you want success for the football club, and that is why you know when you look at, at, at figures like Eamon Dolan, they're they're so well lauded in the club and so well respected because of the work they've done for the community and bringing those players through. Um, I mean, it, it, in terms of the future, Abby, what what is the way back for uh, Reading FC women currently in terms of, of of what it looks like next season and and beyond that, what what happens to them moving forward? Just before I answer that, I want to just touch on that little bit that you mentioned about success as well. So obviously, the first team remaining in the championship after everything that's happened with the club but actually you have to also acknowledge that the under 21s absolutely like rampaged through their league mm. this year and won it outright they they won the barks and bucks cup final as well and <clears throat> mm. the, the under 14s also won won their league this year as well so i mean that's success after success after success throughout throughout the age groups and yet we're in this position still so that also is a baffling as well the fact that we're suddenly in this position after so much success um so yeah that just is another kind of punch to the gut um <clears throat> but yeah in terms of the future I mean they, they, they mentioned it in in the statement didn't they about how they're kind of hoping that they've um like they can't they've kind of nurtured and developed developed the game and that they're they're hoping that having dropped down to tier five, that they're possibly going to gain back-to-back promotions in the top divisions in the future. But I don't know if they're not willing to invest at this level after kind of seeing the success, like I just mentioned, of the under-14s and the under-21s. Not really sure how they see see that happening. And as women's football kind of gains popularity and stuff like that, it becomes more and more difficult Um so I'll use Ascot as an example, actually. So <clears throat> they are also pretty responsible as well for a few few Reading players as well. They've had lots of players come through through Ascot kind of in their early years and then go on to play for the likes of Reading and actually lots of clubs who are kind of in and around the area here now as well. Um, and they have been in the southern region, I want to say a decade now. Um, <clears throat> and the last two seasons, they've been up there and very much looking likely to gain promotion and last season they they lost out just about to Abingdon Town by a point and then again this season they lost out by a point again to Bournemouth Sports so tier five is not an easy tier as well um, to, to get through and it's it's difficult and that the quality that is coming through is more and more evident and actually because there is clubs who are realising how fruitful and that the women's football is is the future and that's how you get more people involved at your club especially at grassroots level that they are investing in their in their teams and you see them with multiple coaches on the sideline and they're training multiple times a week and they've got programs in place and they're genuinely like interested and care about things like their nutrition and how they look after themselves and stuff like that. So the idea that we're just going to go for back to back promotions is a little naive, I think actually in, in terms of the statement. Um, and so, and having cold, it's not as if we're going straight in with this championship set of players either as well. Like there's, there's nobody there right now. So, that's a, another interesting thing is what are they intending to do to, in terms of recruitment in the next seven, eight weeks so that they are ready to play? Because ju- just like in tier two, like there's a certain amount of players that need to be registered in the side um, before the season kicks off. So like, are we even going to have enough players registered? to? So <clears throat> I don't even know how we can look at the future right now when we're not sure what's even in front of us in, in this moment as we're talking, really. Mm. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, you mentioned some clubs there, you know, Ascot, Wickham, uh, Bournemouth Sports, Abingdon, for example. Do you do you see there's going to be a knock-on effect for those clubs in terms of them, you know, those players looking at Reading and, and potentially being approached by whoever is doing the recruitment for, for Reading women and them sort of almost jumping ship from those clubs and, and coming across to us? Because, you know, there, there could be 
a detrimental effect to, to those clubs. And I know it's football, I know it's sport and all the rest of it, but you know, that th- th- that could be the case, couldn't it? In terms of Reading, just, just walking around poaching loads of players. Yeah, I think there's potential for that. But again, at this level, at this stage, the, they're, they're players who are kind of can kick on with their careers if they want. I think it's really important that people find stability in their clubs. And that's a real appeal for a lot of players is that they can see that there's investment in, in their in their team and in their club and there's a level of stability. And we, we just don't have that right now, do we? We can't, we can't show that level of stability. Mm. And it feels like this was a bit of a snap decision from kind of the reaction on social media and stuff like that. So I, I, I think that's, that isn't a draw for players necessarily. Um, so yeah, I'm not, possibly there's definitely like, Football is still a fickle world, to be honest, at, at times, isn't it? So there's no reason why people won't be wanting to to put on a Reading shirt at some point. But yeah, I think there's a real level of um, uncertainty amongst the club. So maybe, maybe not. I, I really don't know. And I think, yeah, like I said, there's lots of teams who are in the division, especially like it's, it is a competitive division, Um for the most part. And actually there's lots of new teams in there this year as well. There's been quite a bit of movement around mm. and there's been a few kind of relegations and promotions <clears throat> um, because it works a little bit differently. It's not quite as black and white, the promotion as it is at the top of the, the tiers. Um, teams can often, so for example, actually, if I think about the tier below that, so that's where the likes of Cavisham United play and Wargrave and things like that. So Slough on the goats. won their we division. Love the goats. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh, Slough Town will be playing in that division as well. And whilst yeah. they didn't come first, um, they were able to apply for promotion. Um, so, yeah, there's a little bit of difference in how that works. There's been a quite a bit of kind of there's been a bit of lateral movement in, in the division as well as promotions and then also relegations from National League. So um, I think it's only going to prove to be an even more competitive division this year. So, yeah, like, like I said before, the idea that it's going to we're going to walk straight into back-to-back promotions is, is naive of thought. Um, so, yeah, I d- there's just so much uncertainty that I, I can't mm. be sure that people want to be immediately pulling on a Reading shirt when they, they've got a bit more security in a club that they've maybe been been at for a little while or has been in the division for a while. I mean, there's, you know, there's nothing to say that, that in a year's time, whoever is in charge, if, if anyone is ever in charge of Reading Football Club again, um, you know that they don't they don't pull the plug on that and go right that's it we're, we're completely doing away with the women's division we hope that that's not the case of course but there is like you said there's, there's so much uncertainty around it um, you know we don't know if Liam's going to stay we don't know where the team are physically going to play let alone train so there are there are lots of logistics to be sorted um, and and Ross you know looking generally at women's football there there does seem to be. Uh, not everywhere, but but certainly that you know the high. I'm thinking of the high profile stuff that we've heard recently in terms of the Manchester United women, in terms of how they are potentially going to move forward with their new ownership model. Blackburn Rovers as well, obviously ourselves. There there does seem to be, you know, a, a, a failing at, at these clubs of of being able to protect the women's uh, division within their clubs um, and, and being able to to support that. Why? In a nutshell, do you do you think this is happening more and more in women's football? Yeah, it's weird times for um, uh, women's football if that does become a trend, right? Because I think, as Abby was saying, um, you know, even in Tier 5, um, there are some really good teams and good players down there now and players that can kick on with their careers. And one of the things I would expect from what has at least been sold to us in the media is the, you know, and finally um, has, you know, it's seemingly manifested uh, it, it is the rise of the women's game in the last, you know, five to 10 years, you know, partially through the efforts of the lionesses in, in the UK. Um, so it is weird um, and, and a little disconcerting to start hearing this kind of attitude from uh you know, some other clubs and some, some big clubs, but I would put a little bit of that down to <laughs> the weirdness of the, the Manchester United takeover and or semi takeover and all that kind of stuff. So 
yeah, yeah. But I don't want to talk about that too much. Uh, more, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think these decisions are short sighted if people are reducing funding for uh, ladies' teams and, and things like that. I think your opportunity for, um, community development which is again the most important thing and that's the thing i'll always say first but also you know as a marketer it, for pr and for um a well again doing the right thing community but like there's just such an opportunity there um you know like there's a a whole market as of like people who will watch this stuff over here uh in the in in america um i don't know if you guys have seen but there is a new uh female basketball star um and she is basically driving thousands and thousands of people to uh stadiums they they've been moving their games into um the nba stadiums and things like that and they've been selling them out um it's driving a huge amount of interest into the league so all across the world um i think we're finding you know people watch women's sports and so again like i just think the decision making behind uh reducing funding for for any of these things is short-sighted um i think that the opportunity is there um the floor is getting higher you know the the the, the teams that are at the top um like manchester united and like you know until la you know a few years ago like, until now reading um they need to set the example and they need to do better yeah i mean setting the example is is a key point for me in terms of actually certainly with our club and and having some sort of assurances over the next few weeks that the youth pathways potentially some of the elite pathways are going to be able to be kept on in some format um, you know, I'm not naive enough to think that, okay, well, every girl that attends an under 14 or under 16 training camp and then goes into the, you know, elite pathway that's there, for example, then ends up in the first team. That's not going to happen. But, you know, we, we need all the all the help that we can get currently. And, and moreover, and, and Sarah Turner in the week, you know, uh, the head of um, the Supporters Trust said it on ITV that, you know, boys and girls in this area need um, a focus point, need a, a goal, need a need a bar to be able to achieve, and and be able to see themselves potentially progress into the first team of, of their local football club and the team that they love. You know, we, we mentioned Tia Primer and and Madison Perry um, earlier as as starting points, but there's been lots of, of players that have come through the women's academy that have gone on to to great success. You know, um, Frank Herbie, <laughs> like the biggest one of the lot, surely. You know, and so actually there needs to be some sort of um, equality there to be able to, to, to allow both boys and girls to achieve what, what many of us always wanted to achieve, but just weren't good enough in the case of me anyway. But, you know, having those pathways protected, I think are absolutely vital. And I'd like to see in the next few weeks, something around that confirmed by, you know, by the club, by, by Red and FC women, that, that we've got some sort of legacy in place that's not going to help us now necessarily, but, you know, over the course of a four, five, six years potentially would, would be able to bring those players through to, to feed into the first team. Um, I mean, Abby, you know, it, it is a complete mess and it is a, it is a disaster and it is incredibly disheartening. But f for you, what what would you like to see happen over the next you know, two, three weeks, for example, with regards to, to Red and FC women? Um, I think kind of if, I, if I put my fan hat on, um, I'd like to know where we're going to be playing next season because it seems absolutely ridiculous that we would have a Tier 5 team playing at the Select Car Leasing Stadium. Um, and I assume potentially that that is a considerable amount of the kind of running cost of the team is having them play. At, at the stadium I don't really know like I'm I'm not I'm not versed in that sort of thing but yeah I'd like some kind of confirmation around <clears throat> where the team will be playing um it would be nice to know if there is any any players left left at the, at the club as far as far as I know there, there isn't and I obviously we mentioned the whole two players contracted I don't actually know who those two players are um I think they might be under 21s, but I'm not really sure. So that would be nice to have that confirmation. Also, just also from a staffing kind of perspective, I think that's another thing as well that I found really disheartening is the fact that, I mean, obviously we've had the, the release list, but actually 
what about the staff? And as as far as I can tell, and as far as I know, um, having kind of been, um, maybe not friends, I don't, they probably wouldn't consider me a friend, but like knowing a few of the staff pretty well, there's they've been very much left in the dark. So actually, who's left? And as as you mentioned before as well, like Liam and Dan, both manager and assistant. I'm assuming they're not sticking around. They they came from Oxford United, so. I can't imagine they'll be back there, but just knowing what kind of their plan of action is. Um, and yeah, just, just that kind of certainty around, yeah, the, the, I think that's the three things I'd want to know from a kind of fan perspective, definitely. Um, kind of who's left, where are we playing? I mean, they're, they're pretty key things, right? As a fan, you know, you want to know, firstly, who you're supporting in terms of the players and who you're getting behind um, physically, where, where you're going to have to go to games. You know, is there a possibility of a ground share here? Is it literally, you know, grassroots? I'm thinking of, you know, places like Finch Hampstead where it is literally grassroots and you turn up and there's like a rope around a pitch, as, as I'm sure there are all over Berkshire. Um, and of course, the manager as well, because, you, you know, we've seen it with the first team for, for the men's. We, we we need to be building something. You know, we need to be able to go, well, actually, is, he, is it, are Liam and Dan going to be able to continue the work that they started this season? I would agree with you that, I, I you know, I don't see them sticking around I might be wrong and, and they might be incredibly um you know excited by this change I doubt that will be the case I'm sure they could do a job well as they proved in in any championship side uh, possibly even you know WSL maybe I don't know but you know that you wouldn't blame them for walking away at this point as you would with any other staff member that still has a job but wants more security somewhere else so it's a very very difficult scenario and you know if anyone from the club is is listening, you know, Abby's just come on here as a fan and, and said how she feels. And these things need to be answered pretty quickly in order to to try and, you know, find some positives in this incredibly dire situation. Um, Ross, you know, just to kind of close it off, really, do you do you see any light in the darkness currently in terms of where we're at as, as, as a club with the women's division? Do, do, do you feel like there's going to be progress made? Is it is it going to be as hard as we all imagine it to be, as, as hard as Abby has, has mentioned about the league and the competitive nature of it, you know, are there any positives to take currently from this situation? Uh, it's difficult at this particular moment in time. It feels like everything's on hold really at the moment. Like it was, uh, you know, other than the, um, you know, the men's preseason having seemingly started, um, it feels a little bit like just about everything with the club is on hold right now. And, and hopefully I'm wrong and we're days away from some sort of announcement. But yeah, no, it's difficult to find much hope for that at the moment. I just, you know, I often think that having just even like one really dedicated person, um, you know, within the club or within any kind of organization there to sort of drive, um, an initiative forward and obviously that initiative here being the women's team, then um, i just really hope there's someone at the club who really cares uh, about the, the women's setup and uh, is, you know, sort of able to at least generate some sort of positive um, out of this. And it might not be possible to see that now, but maybe down the line. Um, so yeah, difficult to be super positive right now. And I guess I just hope that the, the club has somebody there or will hire somebody there who can actually give the women's team the attention it deserves. But uh, given, you know, given what's happened in the last week, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to really think that right now. So yeah, um, it's, it's a really disappointing thing that's happened. Um, and this is just the worst consequence so far of the, um, the delays and uh, the dithering and the ownership debacle. Yeah, and that, you know, that looks set, unfortunately, to continue. Um, doesn't show any signs of abating at the moment. You know, we we, we know as much as, as you guys listening to this, we're not in the know at all. So, yeah, we, we're kind of as we were. Um, nothing's changed. We, you know, we've had all the information that we've had so far from, from Reading Women. Um, same with the first team of the football club. So, yeah, it's not, it's not, um, it's not a desperately positive situation at the moment, put it that way. Um, Abby, before we let you go, I know that you are embarking on quite a challenge, which is not necessarily associated with football, but uh, we would like to give you the opportunity to share what you're doing 
and why you're doing it. I think it's September you're doing it, isn't it? Is it September? Yeah, that's the one. <clears throat> yeah, uh, go on, what so, are you doing? <laughs> uh, on September the 14th, I will be doing the Thames Valley Ultra Challenge Path. So I'm walking 100 kilometres non-stop from the delights of Putney Bridge all the way to the delights of Henley on Thames. Um, I think I'm probably wow. mental for doing it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I didn't I, know this. This is incredible. I, I mean, 100 kilometres is like, that's pretty extreme, isn't it? Yeah. So you know. I did half, so 52 kilometres uh, back in 2018. Um, and I did halfway around the Isle of Wight, essentially. So, so from, from bottom to top. God. Um, and I think... I don't think the Isle of Wight was that big. <laughs> I know, yeah, well, all the way around, yeah, it's huge. Um, do not recommend it, it was traumatising, but clearly not traumatising enough because I fought six years later, yeah, let me do it all over again. But to be fair, down the Thames, it's nice and flat, it's very civilised, um, so it's going to be a different kind of challenge. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing it in aid of Prostate Cancer UK. Um, it just felt okay. like a, a good good charity to choose. It's, it's, it's affected me personally, if I'm being completely honest, and uh one in eight men will be diagnosed at some point in their in their life with prostate cancer um mm. and i think um so I, my my walk that i did around the isle of wight i did it for um cancer research and so um it's it sadly a, a disease that's affected my family and so and i think it, it affects everyone these days doesn't it you can't meet anybody who hasn't somehow been affected by it, whether mm. it be that they've experienced it themselves or a family member or friend or something is going through it so um yeah it felt like a a good good charity to pick and you know it's something to focus on whilst the the club is in disarray so uh yeah yeah i mean 10 weeks to go so yeah incredible um thing you're doing you know any anyone who raises money for charities is incredible but i mean 100 kilometers is I mean that's that's excessive, isn't it? I mean that that's I don't want to put you off and I don't want to freak you out, but that I mean that's that's that just blows my mind. That you know, no, I could do five k. I do I do be alright five k running. I, you know, I've pushed to ten on my good now. days, but a hundred kilometers. I mean that's that's incredible, isn't it? Could you do a hundred k, Ross? You probably couldn't, could you? No, I definitely could not do a hundred k, and I and I. Uh, but I, I take my hat off to you, Abby, and I take my hat off to you for 52 kilometers as well. That's nothing to, to sniff at either. So, yeah, definitely uh, get behind our uh, Reading fans. You can um, find uh, it on my social media. I was going to say, how do, how do we donate, Abby? How do we yeah, do that? Yeah, so I've got, I've got a Just Giving page. So you can just search my name or Just Giving if you want, but also um, you can go on my social media. And um, it's my pinned post on my Twitter um, if you want to head there. Um, I am actually very excited that I've hit my uh, fundraising literally today. Oh, um, so I am 100% ready in terms of the, the minimum that you have to raise, but any donation, big or small, is is massively appreciated. Um, I've got 10 yeah. weeks to go, so I reckon I could do all right out of that. So yeah, just yeah, and any support is is massively appreciated. And um, <clears throat> I'll have a tracker on the day as well if you just want to check where I am, see if I'm st- still still on track, essentially. For <laughs> yeah, if you haven't fallen in the river or anything, <laughs> yeah, you made it back to <laughs> no, Henley exactly, and stuff like exactly. yeah, exactly. I think well, some way okay. like, there's there's checkpoints as well where like spectators can go as well. So I think some of my friends have attempted to follow me along really, um, and I'm. But yeah, so yeah, it should be good. I'm, I'm hoping for some good weather because it was absolutely sweltering when I did the one in the Isle of Wight. I did that. It was it was a May one. But yeah, it was absolutely okay. sweltering when I did it. And also all of my training walks prior, like up to that as well, had been in lashing rain. So yeah, it was an experience to say the least. And I managed to fall over in the only patch of mud on the entire island as well. <laughs> many people asked me if I'd fallen over. I just thought, what do you think I've been doing? I'm not rolling around in the mud. So yeah, um, but luckily I, should, I think I should be all right in September. Who knows? But then we might get an Indian side of things that's been chucking it down recently. So who knows? Yeah, I mean, hopefully it'll be all right. I mean, I'm just just looking now. I mean, you, incredible. You've raised five hundred and eighty pounds already, which is which is amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and if you if you go on Just Giving and you search, you've gone for your full name. I appreciate that, uh, <laughs> Abigail Ticehurst. And what I like about that is that listeners will be able to search you because it's like Tilehurst, but just swap out the L for a C. There we How go. about that? I was thinking ahead. It couldn't be any easier to donate <laughs> money. 
so it's it's like fate has has come together on this very uh very morbid pod shall we say <laughs> um that just about wraps it up for us uh ross thank you so much for uh joining us once again i know you've had a busy week you turned 30 haven't you this week so I well have. done yeah. happy easter and well, all that thank you yeah thank you and, and thank you welcome Abby, to the well party club Thank you. Thank well, this- you. It's uh, my knees are crumbling to dust, but I'm I'm still here and I'm still uh, always ready to talk soccer. Oh, for Christ's sake, football. <laughs> that's that's another pound in the dollar box, that one. So, yeah. Uh, yep. Well done. Um, and Abby, you know, we, we'd, we'd love to have you on in, in better circumstances, but, we, you know, we really appreciate you coming on and, and, and sharing your views. And, you know, hopefully this has provided a little bit of, of kind of, I say release therapy, whatever you call it, but hopefully talking about it is, is a little bit, um, has made it a little bit easier. Um, and you know, you continue to look after yourself and, um, we'll, we'll hopefully get you on again to, to talk about all the players that, that, that we've signed, um, for the club. Who knows? I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. I wonder who the first person through the door will be, but, but time will tell, I guess, but you know, Abby, thanks very much for your time. We, we do appreciate it. I haven't cried. So I think that's a success. I wonder if I can apply to be a player. <laughs> I'm well, this is it. I was going to say, like, you, you, you're talking about tier seven. Just, just go up a couple. Maybe, right. maybe the recruitment teams listen to this and go, do you know what? Give, what, what position do you play? Uh, left back. There you go. Then, I mean, every club needs a left back. <laughs> you could never have too many left backs, surely. So, come on, give, give Abby a go. We'll see her in the in the famous blue and white hoops. How about that? The dream, the dream. Living but the dream. we'll see. <laughs> exactly yeah yeah from a from a from a negative comes a positive we'll we'll see um thank you so much to for to everybody for listening uh really really appreciate that we'll we'll have a kind of another normal pod uh out in due course when there's a few more bits and pieces to talk about we say this every time but we hope we can give you more updates or or kind of analyze the the ownership um situation a little bit more but that doesn't appear to be the case at present at the start of july um we'll see Fingers crossed for for brighter days to come for for everyone connected at the club, and uh, hopefully one day we can we can look back on this with um, with a bit of a wry smile. Have a really good week, everybody. Uh, look after yourselves. Come on, you arms. It's been-